And a big welcome to Nancy White and Keith McCandless. A round of applause, yay! <laughs> you can do that in the uh, official Illuminate or Blackboard Collaborate way using the little icons. And uh, you'll find those just done underneath in the participants panel. We welcome our two presenters today. It's lovely to have a surprise co-presenter today. Keith, I'm really chuffed with that. Yes, I did start the recording. We want to say thank you to our sponsors and supporters in our usual way. And we won't deliberate on that one because you'll see them several times today. We do like to know where you're from. So if you pick up your smiley face or your world icon and place it on the map, you can see that Nancy and Keith are already smiling out there from which state are you in? Oh, you're in Seattle, is that right? We're in Seattle, which is the city, and the state is Washington, which is also abbreviated WA, which some people think is Western Australia. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Indeed. Well, you are among friends today, and your friends are spread across the world. It's always nice to see the lights shining in the different parts of the world. But India. Nancy and, yeah, look at that. If you also want to put in your actual location, be, feel free to put that in the text chat. And in a second or two, we'll move along. And we're going to get started on this fantastic presentation from Nancy and Keith. I can tell you that there are some real good surprises in store for you today. Lots of interaction. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I know that they're going to turn on their video, and I know that maybe some would have, maybe both are going to be wearing a hat. So I'll put mine on for you. Not sure if you can see it real well. This is my Coach Carol hat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Yes, we've got action on the map. Let's move on. Yes. The, load, the slides are loaded. So without further ado, I really want to have a, a big introduction now for Nancy White, who, I can tell you, has been my wisdom warrior for some years now. I have only just met Keith, but I'm sure you're also going to be a, an influence in our lives today. Nancy is going to infect us with liberating structures. How cool is that? So I'm going to hand over to our two presenters. Welcome, Nancy. Okay. Well, I, I, I couldn't find the hat. The hat is actually downstairs, and I forgot to run downstairs. So I'll just wave hello for a second and then turn my video off and um, give uh, my dear friend and mentor, Keith, a chance to say hello. Because if Keith hadn't have been in my life, I would not be doing this with you guys today. So this is definitely, and, and he was willing to let me drag him in here um, uh, to, to play with me. So Keith, you want to say hello? I'll, I'll say hello, and how silly you are. I just, uh, I would jump at any chance to, to work with you. You know that. So uh, thrilled, thrilled to be a part of the, the session. Great. So um, what we want to do today is uh, embody two of my favorite things right now. One, I learned from um, my Knowledge Management for Development community, and that is Confusiasm. And today, we are going to embody the spirit of Confusiasm and the practice of duocracy. And as you can probably decode those words, they're portmanteaus um, that allow us to play and learn at the same time, but at the same time give you give you a really clear sense that I am here working on my edge, not in my area of quote unquote expertise. And so, you know, so like why do a keynote about something you know totally? Why not do a keynote about uh, engaging in something? And furthermore, why do a keynote where we're just talking? So we're going to invite you along the road to think about how to expand your repertoire about engaging each other, learners, engage yourself as a, a teacher or an educator, whatever word you use, so that everybody can be unleashed because otherwise we're never going to get the kind of learning or the kind of change we want to see in the world. It's simply not, not a top-down, center-outward 
world that we live in. And, you know, one of the things that I've learned from all of the friends that I've made in Australia, having been privileged to be part of one of those uh, speaking tours years ago when I went through every capital up to my online engagements in recent years, is that you guys are really willing to leap. So it seemed like a good place to leap and to build that repertoire. And it, we're bringing a repertoire today, and you're bringing a repertoire today. So I'm totally prepared to be surprised. So I invite you to, to surprise us. I want to give you a little design storyboard of our time together today. Um, and in fact, design storyboarding is one of the things that you can do is we're going to, you know, look at our agenda very quickly, go into our first activities, and work through actual real examples, and then talk about it as we go and debrief it. So I'm not going to do no whole bunch of explaining up front. We're just going to jump in. So you're ready to jump in? Oh, well, I am. <laughs> ready. Okay. Okay. And good. And, and one thing I already noticed in the chat is some of you are responding. Some of you are taking notes and adding addition, additions to the to the narrative that's emerging. And I really encourage you to do that because this is a great way to add lots of layers of voices, not just the ones who have the microphone. But we'll be opening up the microphone um, quickly and raise your hand if you want to say something and you don't have access. It will immediately do it. And I also want to uh, mention that Shauna from British Columbia is also with us. She's one of the practitioners of the liberating structures. So we have just, you know, great resources all around us. We have each other. So I'd like you to pick up the drawing tool. If you look to the left of the slide, and you'll see the sort of a highlighter or a pen. And, you know, when you click on it, if, if the highlighter is not uh, available, just go ahead and click on the little one that bounces out, and then pick a color that you like, because for goodness sake, for, for most of you, it's Saturday morning or still, sat, still Friday night for, for you, Sebastian. Um, pick a color you like, and think about the question, you know, where are we starting together? So I am a ninja. If you are a ninja at engaging online learners, uh, engaging learners online, put your, your mark someplace around the right-hand side around a ninja. If you're somewhere in the middle, you know, you could put it anywhere along there that, that's right for you. And if, you know, you don't even know what the heck this means if someone has put there at the X, make a mark of where you are. And just think about yourself and your ability and, and sense of creativity for engaging learners online. And hi, AJ, we're just getting started and people are putting a mark on the line as to where they are along this question of, uh, I'm a ninja at engaging on learners online into the far right, that's the super ninjas. You can tell someone's put glasses there, so they didn't, you know, they're already being creative. And on the left means, I don't even know what the heck they're talking about. So, so let me check here. So the person or the people who put an X on the far left side, um, I'm curious, why did you put yourself down here? So you can either chat or, um, Carol, uh, would you like to have them raise their hands to grab the mic? Yeah, that's a good idea. You've all got the mic available but there's only a couple that can speak at any one time. So just use the little hand raiser, which is the third icon around, which looks like that. Okay, so we have one, Nancy. Um, we invite that person to the mic, yes? Uh, Nancy, your microphone is off. Yeah, I'm talking to myself. I actually do that often, uh, Carol. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. But at least that you want to if you, tell us why you put yourself, where you put yourself on the, you never heard the concept of ninja. So language, ooh, good. So ninja warrior, super skillful, um, can operate in any environment and adjust to that. So that would be uh, my sense of ninja. So let's. Let's check in the middle and let's see who is that lovely green face with the black hair and why did you put yourself around the middle? If you could raise your hand, we'll give you the mic or you could, we could 
you could do it in chat. Heather, you know, that's interesting. I thought it was a pretty common word, so that's a good lesson for me. So who's in the middle? You're the green of Jan. Why'd you put yourself in the middle? It's <laughs> And just to prop in advance, I'm going to ask if you just like to no, click the talk button if you want to answer. Not sure how far there is to go. Okay. And, and someone on the far right, why do you put yourself as a ninja? And please do not be um, too humble. What's more than one good here? Well, that's me wearing the glasses over there on the right hand side. I, I reckon I'm pretty good at engaging learners online. And why? Why? Because I tell you. No, um, because I've been practicing that art <laughs> for uh, a long, long time now, and there's many facets to it. And one of those that I've learned is that you need to allow time for individual learners to be confident in being engaged online. Yeah. That's a, and, and that's a really lovely thing for anybody who is in a facilitative role. Um, there's space. <laughs> and today we're going to play a little bit with that space or how you use pace as a way to allow space, which may seem like a contradiction in terms. So what we just did was called the human spectrogram, and it's a way to just quickly determine where the group is, and I can see that we've got a nice chunk over here in the experience thing, and we have people on this end. And one of the things that I love to do if I'm interacting with people over time is to fold the line from one side to the other and put the people who are newer with the most experienced people for breakouts and learning opportunities or to interview each other. <laughs> That's another good thing. Now. Oh, yeah, we need the smile there. Okay. I want some eyebrows, too. <laughs> and then you have uh, great uh, creative people. I told Keith that he, there would be no worry about people kind of letting loose in this particular group. <laughs> Bring them back, Nancy. Bring them back. It's Bring them back. <laughs> okay. So, so let's think a little bit about your own practice for engaging online learners. So I'm going to give you uh, about 30 seconds to think about how you engage learners online, thinking about your, your actual practice. And even people who are at the left of the spectrum, I'm sure, have at least one thing. And the people on the right, you'll just have to think about that more broadly. And I encourage you, if you have a piece of paper, to write it down, because there's something about cognitively writing it down that sometimes changes. And then I'm going to ask you to go up in pairs. And we are going to work with pairs in a way that may be slightly chaotic and we'll have fun. But let me give you first that 30 seconds of silence, OK? Okay. It's been more than 30 seconds because I need new glasses. So um, now we're going to pair up using the participant list. And sometimes it's helpful to make the participant list a little bit bigger while we go through the pair up process. And um, Keith, do you want to be paired up? Or what I typically do is just help people so I don't pair up, but I want to give you that option. Yeah, Carol and I, I'm happy to pair up with Carol. Okay, so then we have Shauna and Ian would be the next pair, Peggy and AJ, Anne and B. You see what I'm doing? I'm picking pairs down the list. David and Gail, Heather and Jan, Joffre and Juanita, Karen F and Pauline, Penny B and Sebastian, 
Shingo and Steve, and Vlad appears to be away, so if Vlad comes back, I'll grab him. And what you do is you're going to right-click on the person you're paired with, and you can send them a private chat. And this way you can share what you're doing with the other person. So I'd like you to just share how you engage online learners, the other person shares, and have about a minute, minute and a half chat conversation with each other using a private chat. And if anybody needs help with that, please use the general chat and we can help you with that. So this is the, the area that could be slightly chaotic. Oh, Shingo, you don't think you can with mobile, but you can chat. Let's see, Shingo is chaired with Steve, so maybe Steve can send you a private chat. On an iPad, okay, Carol, how do you right click on an iPad? Oh, now there's a tricky one. <laughs> you could do it the long way instead of right clicking. You'd probably have to, hmm, let me think, maybe just left click. Let me, I'll try it on my iPad in a minute, but I haven't been asked that question before. Call me on the hop. Good. Um, and so we'll, we'll pair Vlad and um, Maria who just showed up. Hi, Carol. This is Shauna. I can't seem to be able to type into the chat, even though it looks like my chat is enabled. So I'm not sure what's going on. Okay, Shauna, just tell me what kind of system you're on right now. Um, I'm on a Mac, and I've used Blackboard before, and I could type half a, uh, about 10 minutes ago, but it doesn't seem to work now. Okay, that's a bit weird. Are you able to type into the main room? No, none of them actually. Oh. When that happens to me, I find I have to leave the room and come back in. I hate to tell you. Yeah, that's annoying. Okay. Bye bye. Anyway. Bye -bye. Sorry, Ian. I see your note. I can't reply. Oh, Nancy, I had put the timer on for a minute and a half. Boy, that went through very fast. It did. Nancy, one of the things that I always have to improvise with is to figure out whether people are successfully being in chat and if not, do the problem solving. So sometimes it takes a little bit longer. So I think we should go a little bit longer because there's a couple people still trying to find each other. Yep, I agree. Yeah, there's a couple of things that have gone a little bit pear-shaped. <laughs> this morning, um, that they happen. Okay. So if you can't chat in private chat, go ahead and um, chat with each other in a public chat. And just to repeat, if you're not on an iPad, you click on the person, you right click on the person that you want to private chat with and scroll down on that list and you can send a private chat. But you know what? If it's not working, go ahead and do it in the regular thing. So maybe Vlad and who is it that I paired you with, Vlad? I can't remember already. Maria Colosa from Argentina. So you could just go ahead and chat in the main thing. And it'll be a little bit to scroll, a little bit scrolly, but we can figure it out. And I'm gonna, I'll sing now, Carol. I'll sing just a very brief uh, from our American game show, Jeopardy. And when the song stops, we'll, we'll come back together. <laughs> Lovely. You're waiting for the chat to end? <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> OK, so I can tell that people are going to town. And that's beautiful. So let's go on to the next stage and start building up this good stuff that I'm seeing flowing by because I have to confess as moderator, I get to see all this back channel chat and it's, it's really, really fun. So now I want to come back 
into the main room, and we're going to use the whiteboard here and capture something that showed up in that paired conversation. And in this time, I encourage you to take the text tool, which is the, let's see, the fourth one down on the whiteboard tools. And if you're going to type something long, you can use the A with the lines, which creates a little chat box. But if, if, if it's nice and short, just use the big A and type, um, you know, one of the insights that, that you garnered in your conversation. Thanks, Carol. It's funny, when, the, when we leave the mic on, we hear the typing and all the little noises that happen at the same time. Cool. And, you know, Nancy, right now in my head, I'm thinking through how to emulate this in a physical training space. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad you asked because we will definitely talk about that in a second. So as we, as we look here, as people are typing in, you know, what do you notice about as we accumulate up from our individual thinking, from our parent thinking to our group thinking, what do you notice about these? these comments that you're seeing on the whiteboard. And you can type that in the chat, or if you want to raise your hand and speak, we'll make sure you can have the mic. So I was moving things around messing with somebody there. I think I just ran into someone. So any any thoughts you want to share? Peggy goes, I found people need to be comfortable with the tool before they can actively engage in a topic. Yeah. And they have to be engaged with the topic, too. <laughs> One of the things that struck me in looking at this was, you know, the different ways that people interpret the word engagement. Um, and, and you know, the, all these different levels, and it was fascinating to me. So you have this set around tools, and um, there's also these sets around, vo you know, voice and, you know, presence and, and really honoring the human, each human being. So there's lots of different things here. Any other thing you've noticed?
Peggy, because that often happens in um, whiteboard use in here. That you know, after we've spent a few minutes trying to figure out how things work, oh, we've moved on. Yeah. I like this little square over here. I'm trying to understand what that little square means. I'm assuming it has the steep significance of the blue square in the gray rectangle. So let me, I'm going to move on because I want to, you know, give us a chance to take, to work through some different experiences. But kind of looking at this particular practice, which is one, two, four, all. And, and Keith, um, can I toss it over to you? Uh, sure. Yeah, good. Um, so we just did a one, which is the self-reflection. Nancy invited 30 seconds of silence or a little more, which is a pretty unusual thing to have happen online or face-to-face. -face. And, um, and then progressed into this pair, which is the two in the one, two, four, all. And if you were really good at, with groups on this, on Blackboard, uh, you could throw people into groups of four. And through each of those, you're individually and together sifting and sorting all of your ideas about, in this case, uh, engaging learners online. And then all of these comments to all, all of the chat is the, is the all here. And so this may seem perfectly simple, and yet uh, if we use it all the time to structure face-to-face uh, -face or virtual conversations, we, and if you use it more frequently, you uh, can just get great ideas very quickly in which every single person is included and all of their ideas to move forward are unleashed. So uh, the purpose of using this is to engage everyone simultaneously in this kind of work. And one of the things that is interesting about this progression is it's quite fast. The cycles are, are quite quick. So if in uh, one minute, two minutes, four minutes, and a little bit of time on all, you may have spent 10, 11, 12 minutes. And it, it can be very productive. But if not, just do another round of one, two, four, all. So this is probably the simplest and most um, useful liberating structure of all. And it's, it's kind of a substitute for uh, uh, conventional brainstorming, um, in part because any number of people from two to 2,000 can engage in it simultaneously. Um, so what did, I guess, the question uh, that we'd like to ask right now, and we can continue on in the, the chat to all, uh, what did you notice about going through that one, two, four, all cycle? Was there anything that you, and I'm not very good at reading the chat, maybe it's already being talked about, but was there something about just that, that progression that you noticed uh, that you'd like to comment on? And I think you could write it on the, right onto the slide or uh, use the chat, either one, either way. I think the chat might be faster for some people because they don't have to manipulate the text. Yeah. So, you know, works really well. China, you know, multiple settings, very effective. Freedom to challenge oneself. Yeah. You can do some sifting and sorting of your own ideas because of the exchange. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As I was going through that, I realized that it was in miniature, the usual way that we go through uh, creating uh, a, or establishing um, trust with the person. So you, you introduce, you ask questions, and you listen. And, you know, in a short space of time, that can be quite empowering. And then you move very quickly into some of the sharing. Yeah, and, and you know, uh, Carol, you talked about using this face-to-face. -face. I think we're very practiced at verbally, uh, quickly engaging with each other, um, changing the modality of typing or trying to watch different places or, you know, understanding how to set up that private chat. 
can slow it down, but it's definitely something that I'm finding works better with repeats. So I'm working with a team. We're having a webinar, a web me, a web-based meeting. So let's say we're having a learning meeting. Um, once we know it's one too far, I'll okay, can everybody think about that for a minute and then pair up odds and evens on the participant list and then we'll come back in a few minutes. And, and then we could just go right into it quite quickly. Um, I think the awkwardness of the platform has played into the experience. And the other thing that I've noticed, because I've tried this on a couple of different platforms, is the subtleties of different platforms means that, you know, if you're facilitating this, you have to have understood some of the subtleties. So here we've got Carol and Keith and Sean and I, we can all kind of improvise as we go. But the other thing is there's some tools, like I was on WebEx three weeks ago, and then I was on it one, one week ago, and the interface was different. Same on Google Plus. So for me, there's also a technology piece to this that is always surprising me. So I have to be pretty flexible. And I'm curious um, why you love the private chat. Uh, because it forced me to actually get involved. I could see that my partner B wasn't responding, so I knew she was having he was having difficulties with technology. So it forced me to explain to find them and. It's really nice to be able to talk to someone you don't know, and it really does take you outside your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, particularly um, I think where we expect to be a, a viewer in an online space lately. I think webinars have become such this push thing where all you do is sit and listen or, or do your email. So uh, I want to move along. Uh, if you have any other questions and we need to finish this up asynchronously in the uh, online space, we can do that too, but I want to keep moving along and really start kind of naming what we're talking here. And I'm so grateful that Keith and his um, thinking partner, Henry, have created Liberating Structures. So this is just a moment to thank both of them, Keith in person and Henry, wherever you are, I'm waving to you across the, across the world. And, and just keep just to tell a super short story of, of kind of liberating structures where it started because for me that story helps situate why it's important. Yeah. Uh, well, one super brief thing. Uh, Henry and I had just met and we were working with a big group in the middle of the United States in Ohio, really unlikely group, and we were uh, doing some improv prototyping, which is one of the liberating structures. And it was the senior team and the CEO with all of their direct reports, 100 people uh, sitting around a small group of uh, eight or nine or ten people. And we were inviting them to do some improv. It was sort of fun. And, you know, we didn't have there were no liberating structures. But the things we did, uh, all of a sudden the CEO popped up in the middle of a meeting and said, that was so fabulous. What we just did, that the thinking, the way we were interacting, was so much better than what we have ever done. Everything that we just talked about is now a formal decision. And uh, Henry and I looked at each other. Our breath was taken away. And we, had, we didn't notice that anything was different. But apparently, whatever we had done, and we didn't even really were paying attention really to what we had done, was so powerful for this group that they made the work, uh, they made decisions. And so we started to take ourselves more seriously immediately following that and decided to write down a few things we were doing. So almost all of the work that you'll see on the website, if you go to the website, is us trying to write it down so everybody could do it and uh, not make it a mystery. So you don't have to rely on a professional facilitator or, a, you know, anybody from the outside to be able to do it. Just here are the minimum requirements to be successful and productive um, with the group to help them work, help each individual work at the top of their intelligence and to create that opportunity for everyone else. So uh, that was the su wonderful surprise about and my story about liberating structures. So Nancy, are you there? 
I forgot I muted myself again. What I noticed when Keith started telling me these stories, I remember we were sitting on my deck one afternoon and he had brought over chocolate, which is why Keith is also a wonderful friend, um, was that when he was telling me these stories, the bits that resonated with my experience I found that I had been doing some of those things as part of my practice, and those some things were actually the more effective bits of my practice, but I had no awareness of what I was doing. So for me, liberating structures not only is a great tool, actionable, usable, shareable, spreadable, you can infect people with it, but it also helped me see my own practice in a new way. So I want you to hold that idea because I think when we think about how we look at our own practice as teachers or learners and have to, to, to have some way to talk about it, we actually increase our depth, increase our ability. So for me, there's a lovely meta layer here. Um, but what the, the other thing I learned is that the way Keith was forced, Keith and Henry were forced to kind of write about it, they put some particular uh, framing around it. And again, Keith, I want to toss it back to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, here's some things that attributes. Uh, there's a lot of things that could be a liberating structure, um, but they pretty much have to have all these qualities or they don't cut it. So super simple, like the one we just did, uh, anyone Non-experts can get great results. Uh, they've got to be very results-oriented. You've got to accomplish something. Uh, super fast cycling. Uh, everybody is included every time if they choose to be. Uh, it couldn't work for one person or thousands. Uh, should be seriously fun, uh, boosting both freedom and responsibility. And they spread themselves. Once you've seen one, you can do it. You're, you do not need a colored belt as a, uh, a <laughs> you know, or a, you will not get a certificate after this webinar, I assure you. And what's interesting, what really took our breath away was the, the tiny little behavioral shifts that we're suggesting, uh, and, and they're in the protocols of how we meet, how we plan, how we decide and relate. Uh, they're, they're really quite, quite simple little things. So that's, uh, that's kind of one way to describe uh, uh, the attributes of them. And, you know, particularly seriously fun, it's great to be in a room where this starts happening and you see, we, you go through a, a, a string or a collection of liberating structures and you sense how the energy shifts from when you walk in the door from when you walk out the door. And particularly for people who feel like they haven't had a lot of ability to do this stuff, they've been, they feel like the world is being done unto them and they don't have it, some agency in it. That's a significant change, and for me, that's a great way to think about the liberation part of it. The other part of it that really responded to me and goes back to something that Carol talked about having people draw is um, Keith and Henry put together a, an icon for each of the liberating structures. And when we're working online, this idea that we can visually engage with each other is really important because we're often in this either text or verbal place. And the visual is everything else, so this is really great. Um, and then once you get used to it, you can just throw off the icon and everybody knows where you're going. Oh, yeah, let's do that. So there's this, the novelty part of it when you're using it in a one-time only, the visuals help people understand things. And then the icons become a pattern itself that you can use and, you know, quickly use these in the day-to-day -day work thing. So it's not just something you do for a one-time workshop. They can be day-to-day -day practices. They can be the recipes, you know, we're, we're making omelets today, and we're making cupcakes tomorrow. And, you know, I like to make cupcakes more than once, but almost every now and again, you know. So some of these you might use the one, two, four, all, as um, Shauna said earlier, it, it's, it, and Triz, I use Triz a lot too, would be, you know, the things you made every day. And <laughs> there's lots of laughter. We're going to talk about Triz, so that's great. I'm glad you brought it up, Shauna. So, for those who like meta stuff, I'm just going to briefly talk about uh, meta, but then we'll move back on. But this might be something you want to come back and look at later, because um, it, it's, it's one of those things, if you come back to it, you see something different, at least for me. So the basic microstructures for the liberating structures are these five things. They're the micro-organizing design elements. And one of them, make an invitation to me, super resonates 
for any good facilitation, whether you're facilitating learning or facilitation kids, you know, getting together at the zoo or whatever it is. And thinking about that invitation is a great practice no matter what you're doing. The second is to distribute participation. And when Keith and Henry and Shauna talk about inclusion, this is where we get away from me up at the front talking at you and you all in pairs and talking. So you can you can distribute it into one and one two four all is classic with one person, with two people, with four people. But you're using this ability to give people more intimate time with each other for parts of the process. The third is to configure the group. So sometimes you've got that alternation between you know small group, large group, which is a very common pattern in all kinds of facilitation. Um, and it's going to vary depending on who's in the room and what process you're going through. Space is going to be an interesting thing because I'm really still trying to figure out how to talk about arranging space online. But when we're in the room, it's like having chairs that you can move around and forget about those tables where everybody's stuck around something. It's, you know, lots of places that people can, you know, configure and reconfigure depending on what you're doing. But you give people some clues, like gathering groups of four in, 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 in huddle knee to knee so you can hear each other. This idea of knee to knee and listening for me is a particularly compelling one. And then you allocate the sequence of what's going to happen in the time. Now, again, I'm still learning what the time cycles look like online compared to what they look like offline. And I'm finding them not exactly the same. And I think part of it is the configuration of the tools, but part of it is also trying to understand how to read the cues in an environment where people either have to type something to give you a cue, whereas you can watch it. Um, one of the things that I've seen kids do face to face is to know when to dig deeper. And, you know, when seeing people are just still sticking on the surface of something is to prompt them or prod them to go deeper. And I haven't quite figured out how to do that online very well yet. So, so this idea of trans transitioning these microstructures into an online space for me is still a bit of a, well, it's a lot. It's not a bit of it. It's still a mystery thing. Sean or Keith, do you have anything to, to build on that or fix? Um, oh, that's good, Nancy. That's good. Um, yeah, it's good. Timing is trickier. Yeah, exactly right. You can't, this is not a sit back, uh, whatever kind of facilitation. It's an in your face, move it forward. Uh, let's be sure we're all moving and moving together when possible. And so there's far more mystery. You get many less clues um, online about how to effectively intervene. So don't know what to do about that yet. We're still learning. Yeah. And you know, and this is Shauna. Go ahead, Shauna. Sorry, and I just have to uh, emphasize that as well. That it's very, as a facilitator in a face-to-face -face place, you can you can watch the small groups and you can see what the energy is in the room and know where you might need to support people or just let them go. It's much harder to do that if people are working in private chat or in breakout rooms. So it has to be a little bit of a mechanism, and I'm not sure what that is yet either. About how do you actually track the energy and make sure that uh, it's going well for participants. Yeah. yeah, and this idea of energy, those of us who are face-to-face -face folks, you know, we don't always know how to describe that, but we always know what it is. Um, I think one of the things that I noticed this time compared to when I did this last week in a, a WebEx space was I could see, as with moderator privileges, I could see on the back channel the private chat, and in some tools you can't, but it was really helpful for me to see the private chat. Um, it went by so fast that it was hard for me to... Um, deeply observe it. So that's something that I noticed today that's slightly different than before for me. Well, one thought I want to give there, Nancy, is if you were a contact group and you're trying to accomplish something, something as simple as uh, every so often checking, well, are we making progress? This way we're talking together, are we making progress? And uh, if not, you know, and give me a number, you know, say give me a number, uh, if it's uh, if it's 10, we're making great progress, or if it's under 7, uh, write something in chat about why we're not making, what would help us make progress if it's under a 7 or a, you know, make it very tangible. Uh, are we getting somewhere here? And then anybody that isn't getting somewhere has a chance to say, well, here's an idea. And whether or not you 
go with that, a suggestion is another thing, but uh, uh, it would be one way to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Pe Peggy asked, or asked something that, important that I think is both a general question for me about liberating structures and also um, uh, an online one. And let me go, I just got, just found it, I just lost it. Something I wondered about is whether someone can be personally engaged but not actively participating in chat or on mic. And I, my question back to you, Peggy, was how does that feel for you? Can you still feel engaged if you're not chatting or on the mic? Yeah, so can I. And, you know, I, I come, one of the strong influences in my life is the, you know, the learning theory behind communities of practice, which, you know, legitimizes legitimate peripheral participation or lurking. Um, and, and for me, though, the context would vary. So if it is essential that everyone was actively engaged to move something forward, then, you know, I would be paying more attention to those cues. But there's some places where the person listening may be doing some synthesis or some insights, and then all of a sudden, you know, three quarters of the way down the road, come up with something to the rest of us who are too busy talking to notice. So, um, you know, and as Shingo says, there, there's that kind of zone that they move in. So I, I personally um, believe that workers are doing something in the ecosystem useful, but I don't always know what it is. Or I rarely know what it is, but I have faith. It's there. I have a suspicion that face-to-face, -face, I've been told multiple times, people won't engage. And then every time that they do, they do. So it really depends on did you invite an interesting topic, and is it inclusive enough and moving forward enough that everybody stays right with it. And um, that's really, really what it's about. Uh, and it's hard to do in this kind of environment. I think we're doing great today, probably. Uh, maybe somebody should give me a number here, but uh, uh, I stand to go. How are we doing on a one to ten? Yeah, are, are we doing something, are we moving forward? Is it kind of productive? Uh, and if it's uh, less than a, you know, a 10 is like, yeah, great, we're doing good stuff. If it's under 7, any suggestions would be more than welcome. So if, if you can type, and I know some of you can't type because you're on mobile devices, um, it would just take a little temperature here. And, and we'll While that's coming in, I'm going to talk about this chart right here, and, okay. and maybe you can do both. Um, so this, one of the things when we started this, we were looking at presentations and status updates or reports, manage discussion when you bring in a facilitator. I know many of you are educators, but all of those sort of centralize the control of the content. Uh, and usually one person or a small number of people are shaping the next steps. And so all of those conventional ways uh, sort of fit in that bottom left corner. Uh, when we looked at, well, when you distribute control more to people, an open discussion like an open mic, well, there's not actually much shaping of next steps, but you do have distributed control. Brainstorming a small num smaller number of people are invited to shape what's going to happen. And so each one of the liberating structures, literally everybody is included. And the control is distributed in that the pattern, the way that we're interacting uh, shapes the future, shapes the next steps. Uh, nothing is controlled uh, from the center. And everyone is included. So that distributed control, including everybody, is a, is a primary characteristic of this uh, work. And uh, very different than these uh, patterns that we've inherited that are pretty much on autopilot. You know, well, you've got to give a presentation, don't you? Well, no, you don't, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's all I wanted to say about that one. Uh, Nancy or Shauna, anyone want to say anything more? No, except that sometimes it's really difficult for uh, breaking out of traditional educational patterns. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, as a person who probably got to where you are through your expertise and being able to share it effectively, all of a sudden here, you're asked to invite people to outdo you, to out, 
you know, to let's explore that together. And so at least for a moment, it might seem like you're giving up your power. Uh, but in fact, uh, you get it back in um, uh, many times stronger. So, uh, all right. <laughs> okay. So um, let's try one more because we're going to run out of time really quickly. So um, you brainstormed at the beginning some ideas about how you engage people online. And it, it was really interesting. I'm tr I was trying to think about, you know, what to pick out of that. But we'd like to look at, you know, maybe about maybe giving up control. Maybe that would be a good thing to do, Keith. So I'm having a little private conversation in public with Keith. So Keith, do you think talking about giving up control by engaging learners would be a useful one for this exercise? Uh, I think no, maybe. I think uh, I think maybe just the jet general. Um, Let's go with the general thought. We've had this conversation up to this point. So uh, what are you going to do? The question is, uh, where would you place what you're, what you're going to do, how you think about engaging er, uh, learners online, the, the way in which you're doing that. And um, the, that's going to be the topic matter for sorting. It's going to be the big general challenge. I think we can use that. Is that okay? Yeah. Yes. About the way you're engaging learners online, and that you're doing this with others, right? You're you're part of a curriculum design group, or you're in a school, or you're you have others that you're working with on this. And so this is the the context. How do you how are we going to figure out what we're actually going to do? Right. So I'm going to describe this model a little bit, and. Uh, then you're going to have a chance to mark things. And um, so if you, uh, if you know and there's evidence, uh, really good certainty and predictability on, on the bottom here, and it's, there's high and a low. So if you're very certain and you think it's predictable how you can successfully uh, engage learners online, and there's evidence to support that, uh, you might uh, mark something uh, uh, down toward the simple, down the high, high side of that line. If you think there isn't much evidence about what works, and it's really not predictable what's going to work, you might put it more toward the right. The second um, element is agreement. Now, among the people that you work with to uh, decide, it could be even the learners or the other teachers or facilitators you're working with, uh, do they, among those people, uh, is there high agreement about what to do? And, or is it relatively low? Are there lots of different ideas about how to engage learners online? So, for example, if you thought, I'm going to make a little thing here. Let's say that I thought, uh, let's see if I can. I'm going to try to make a mark here, well, but I'm not getting anywhere. Uh, well, Nancy, why don't you put a mark somewhere on this uh, chart? Okay. Hold on. I picked, I picked up the wrong tool. And then we'll in interpret what that might mean. Yeah, my tool just stopped working or I've lost control. Okay. So Nancy's control. Yeah, Nancy, it's in a complex area, so there's not, the, there's not much evidence uh, well, there's low agreement among the practitioners, among the people that are deciding. And um, uh, well, I'm sorry, did that get close? Actually, I, yeah, there's I, not I, much. I, I'm moving it. Okay. <laughs> that doesn't matter where you put it. But I'd yeah. like everybody to be able to, to mark something. So for you, in your context, wherever you're working, um, is there a lot of agreement about how to engage learners online? Or, and is there a lot of evidence about what actually works? And so you put something down in the simple area if that was true. For Nancy, apparently, uh, there's not much certainty or evidence or predictability about what works. And the people, the uh, practitioners that she's in relationship with, um, boy, there's a lot of different ideas. So the simplest way to think about this, simple things are, are like a recipe. Complicated ones, you might need more evidence, more studies. 
to make it clear what to do, or you might need to just uh, get more agreement, work on uh, how you're talking and working with people. For things out there in the complex area, boy, uh, it's like if you have a child, uh, telling them what to do, just telling them to agree with you probably won't work. Um, uh, that, that's not really a good thing. And uh, there might be some issues where there's not going to be agreement for a very long time and very low predictability and certainty. So when you're thinking about your practice of engaging learners online, where do you where do you put it? And then what does that imply for what would you do about that? Okay, so people are putting some stuff on there. Right. So nobody's putting anything in simple. There's some chaotic out there, a lot of complex. So what might be, I'm going to just open this up a little bit, what might be a, a implication for what you would do if you believe, which a number of people do here, that their, their work in this area is in the complex arena? What would be a good strategy or thing to do? Do you? What's an implication of that for your work? And Keith, I just want to note that we're almost to the end of our time, so we're going to have to figure out how to gracefully mm -hmm. transition. Yeah. So I can answer this question, but I'd rather have someone else do it. <laughs> so Does someone want to chime in? Yeah. Yeah, Carol's saying graceful. So I'm just going to say one thing here. Trying a lot of ideas in the complex area and uh, collecting evidence as you go. But don't try to limit the number of things you're trying. Go wild. When you have a complex challenge like this, uh, you want to increase the number of experiments rather uh, dramatically. And don't expect that some evidence is going to instantly give you the answer. Right? It's going to take a while. Yeah, it, I, I would just echo what Shauna typed in was, when I frame something as an experiment, people engage in a different way than if I frame it as something that's really clear and evidence-based. Um, and so I think it's really important to, in that invitation, so if you go back to the microstructure, the invitation here in a complex or even chaotic space is really important for me. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of... Just take us to the end. I, you can see I put this in here. I didn't think we'd have time to do it. One of the, the methods that Shauna mentioned, mentioned that I love is ways of, you know, basically coming in through the back door or reverse brainstorming, a way of thinking about what we can stop doing or what kind of creative destruction we can do. How often have you thought about creative destruction in terms of learning? You know, there are these wonderful opportunities to think about what if, we, what if we really obliterated what was happening and could reinvent it? What parts would we keep about the way we teach and learn online? What parts would we want to add or change or invent in new ways? And by using things like TRIZ, we can open up new possibilities. These liberating structures can give us ways to do the types of things that I hear teachers say they want to do, which is just ignite that ability for people to engage in, and begin to own their own learning in a way that's super useful, pragmatic, practical, but also that lights that fire. And so for every method we talked about today, there's a page for it online. I got to touch the prototype of the book today. I can tell you it's fabulous, and you can find information for that on the Liberating uh, Structure site. Yes, it, it is sparks, Carol. It's just so much at all. And that you have the opportunity to be, we, I, have the opportunity to be ten times bolder and to start thinking about it. So as we go away, I'd really like you to think about this question. And, and, and it's, it could be something you could use a liberating structure with 2510 crowdsourcing. We don't have the time for that today. But the other thing is, is not only do we need to be bold, but we need to think about doing something today, tomorrow. So as you go into another session, maybe you're going to infect that session with something from Liberating Structures. When you go to dinner tonight with your family or uh, uh, in, with your, your teaching and learning cohorts on Monday, what is the piece that you have control of that you can start infecting people with? And I think this is one of the, this was probably the first Liberating Structure that I 
fully adopted from Keith and really appreciated. So we're not going to have time to harvest. That would be another process. I'm just going to skip on by it. But we have a resources slide that you can get later on and also our, our contact information. And super thanks to Keith and Shauna for being willing to play with me and for Carol for hosting us and for letting us go almost two minutes too long. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. Uh, yeah, look, it was a wonderful trip down Liberating Structures Lane, and we thank you um, both for coming on today. So we applaud you. <laughs> but that's uh, one of the, the arts of being a presenter here is knowing when to stop. <laughs> and thank you for doing that. <laughs> so everyone, keep applauding as I move to the last slide now and remind you that um, you can pick up one of our Aussie Live badges thanks to the work of our graphic artist, Shambles Guru. I invite you to join in the other presentations that are ready and waiting for you right now. And with that, I bid you all adieu. Thank you so much, Nancy and Keith. I thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs> Go forth and be liberated. Wonderful. <laughs> Last words? Thanks, Carol. It's terrific. Molto grazie. <laughs>